the title of my presentation uh, intentionally is, uh, is, is, is is my personal journey. So how to reconcile lung physiology with the results, the bad results of the latest studies. Um, the sequence of studies, they, they, are, they are very impressive. Let me just, uh, 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 let's say, remind you about the, this whole sequence that happened in the last uh, 30 years. So we started here, in, when we started the first studies in Brazil about uh, lung protection. Uh, then we published these results, but uh, you see, we st almost a, a decade later, when Keith Hickling uh, was starting to talk about permissive hypercapnia. And then uh, something that uh, people forget, in the, the same year, 98, we had three studies that w about protective ventilation that were completely negative. Completely negative because, in fact, they were showing s more side effects of reducing tidal volume. For us, this was a very bad time, um, because just to give an idea, in our hospital, people started to use back high tidal volume. Uh, so it was a very crazy years. And then in the 2000, we had the famous study of the ARDSnet, which was very positive. And, uh, and then uh, intentionally, the ARDSnet decided to study PEEP and tidal volume in two separate trials. So they used the first one, the, the ARMA study, to show that, that low tidal volume would be good. And then the alveoli was just uh, the study to show that high PEEP could be, let's say, could leverage the good results of low tidal volume. But uh, as you may know, this study unfortunately was negative. As the three other studies, the French study, the Express, the Loves, the Canadian, and even the United States based on esophageal pressure, uh, the, this one was, uh, was, was positive, but it was a very small study, and the, the combination of all other studies was, were negative. And then finally, in the last years, you know the art, which we are going to comment, that was very negative. Then the, we had the Epivent 2, the Farlap, that was mentioned in the, in the previous presentation, and also the Live. The Live is the one that is trying to separate diffuse ARDS against focal ARDS. But uh, all these studies uh, in total produced more than 5,000 patients. And uh, if you think about when we propose the protective strategies, we are talking about four, more or less four combined strategies. So reduce tidal volume, reduce driving pressure, higher PEEP, and permissive hypercapnia. If you think about the final result of the ARMA trial, everyone started only to reduce tidal volume. So this is what, what was what captured the mind of physicians around the world. Everyone was thinking about tidal volume. And then this, in a way, uh, although yeah, I, I believe that this is a simplified strategy, it was a, a history of success. Everyone started to adopt some level of protective ventilation. But then, here, when we tried to achieve a better PEEP titration or higher PEEP strategy, is, it was just confusion. And uh, we could not get the good results that we see in experimental studies. So, the, this is the subject of this talk. Why? why the first part of the story worked, but the second part, which should be a better PEEP strategy, we could not achieve this result. And uh, for me, this is very uh, the most important question we have now in mechanical ventilation. And uh, to the point that um, uh, I remember that uh, in people started to believe that, okay, 
you should not use recruiting maneuvers you should not titrate peep just put an empirical peep low peep or and then people started to be very sloppy with peep uh, and I think the reason the, of this is this whole story because we tried many different strategies and nothing was uh, was was really a success. Um, let's talk a little bit about this study because this was the most controversial studies. I I, I participated in the initial design of this trial, and len uh, later on, when the trial started and I analyzed the first 100 patients, I knew that it would be a failure. And I was very concerned. And then the final result was just, uh, uh, let's say, a confirmation that uh, the study was not well planned. It was very well planned in terms of uh, statistical analysis, but not in terms of lung physiology. Okay, so very good statistics, but very bad lung physiology. Uh, and, uh, and as you know, the, in this study, there were, it, they had an increased mortality when we tried to apply lung recruitment and a better PEEP strategy. A hazard ratio of 1.2, which means that uh, we increased mortality considerably, almost, uh, almost 15 to 20%. So, uh, I, maybe you have seen already this slide, but uh, I like it to, to play over and over again because this, this slide gives us one idea what is happening around the world. So, the first line in blue represents the low PEEP FiO2 table of the ARDSnet. If you, if you are using that table, you have to be on top of, of this line. So, for instance, if you are using 80% FiO2, your PEEP level has to be around 15. If we are using 40% FiO2, your PEEP has to be 5. So, if you are on top of this line, you are using the low PEEP FiO2 table of the ARDSnet. And this is the high PEEP FiO2 table that was used in the alveoli trial and also in the Canadian trial, the LOVs. Mm -hmm. So, very different. And what is this? Is the average PEEP around the world. So, and this was taken from this epidemiology study in more than 50 countries, s which means that uh, people is not following the hype table of the ARDSnet, the low table of the ARDSnet. They are using low PEEP and that, that's it. That's it. So the, uh, for me, this is very disappointing. And, and it's interesting to see the difference between countries. Let me give an example. This is United States. So you see all the points. Each point is one patient. This is the, so this is the low PEEP FiO2 table. So if you look at this slide, almost 500 patients are on top of the line and a few scattered patients are out of the line which means that the Americans follow the protocol. The Americans follow the protocol. <laughs> the French people, they don't care. <laughs> they use low PEEP ever, whenever they can. So it's impossible to, for them to follow any table. And, but on the other hand, the Brazilians, they did the other way around. Look at this. So we are using much higher PEEP than the PEEP, low PEEP FiO2 table. And this is the control group of the ART trial. So the control group of the ART trial should be on top of this line. But then people who had some background that they should use a higher PEEP, uh, so which means that the Brazilians didn't follow the protocol, right? So this should be the control arm, but they uh, this is exactly what, what happened in the RT trial. So the, the control group is not exactly a control group because it's an intermediate PEEP level. So, um, but the, the, the intriguing part uh, of this is that in animal studies, it's absolutely clear that PEEP 
can be protective and for instance this is the most famous slide around the world and we can easily see that a little bit of PEEP of 10 improve the lung condition a lot although we are using the same plateau pressure so there is no question that a little bit of PEEP helps to protect the lung so the rationale of using an ideal PEEP is still valid all the mammal species they suffer from ventilator induced lung injury and they present some benefit of PEEP I can for every species of animal we have studies showing that reducing lung stress by reducing tidal volume is good and that using PEEP is good so why we cannot prove this in humans why randomized trials cannot prove it I'm uh, let me just give an example that the, the clinical trials on mechanical ventilation they are very complex and this is what was happening in those years 95 until the year 2000 I called the hard times why because we had our study showing that protective ventilation <laughs> decreased by half the mortality but the, the three larger studies so more patients than this were showing the opposite you see the control group with high tidal volume had lower mortality in all of them so I this was really bad in my hospital because then they started to use high tidal volumes again and again and I personally suffer a lawsuit in my hospital because I was doing permissive hypercapnia so this was really a bad time in the history of, uh, of uh, mechanical ventilation and then finally we had the ArtsNet study that set up the idea okay you should really reduce tidal volume okay when I saw this very controversial results so three negative studies versus only one positive I, I decided to go to each center performing the study and I, I asked for the data bank and then I capture the daily measurement of airway pressures in those trials and then I took it uh, all the data from individual patients and I plotted here so each uh, each of the studies is a different symbol and then I put here peak pressure risk of death corrected for Apache and age and then you can see a very striking result so higher airway pressures they were killing more patients but individually each of these trials were they were negative the, how you can explain this it's because in each of the trials there was a lot of noise and then patient, sometimes patients in the control group they were receiving high pressures and sometimes the patients in the control group they are receiving low inspiratory pressures so uh, this analysis here is what we call per protocol and when they publish the results they publish the intention to treat so it's very different what physicians think they are doing and what they are actually doing so it's very different so and people forget about this uh, this time and how difficult it was to prove that low tidal volume was 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 important I'm telling you this story because I believe that uh, the same thing is happening with PEEP tidal volume is much easier to prove but PEEP is requires much more individualization and this is why the story of PEEP is so controversial but uh, it's amazing how much this graph is similar to this one which happens in animals so this is coefficient of permeability peak airway pressure you see it looks like the same picture so um, yeah. and finally we had the ArtsNet study and then forever now this question of low tidal volume is, and uh, was let, at least was adopted and then I believe that I step further on this is to instead of focusing on tidal volume is to focus on driving pressures but at least we know that we have to decrease uh, the stress on the lung 
Then uh, the, the history of uh, low tidal volume was a history of su success. Then we have this clinical trial from Bob because, uh, from Jesus Villar was also showing that the reducing tidal volume improved the survival. There is this trial that even using low tidal volume anesthesia, uh, this reduces mortality. So 11 against 6.4. But here again, it's low tidal volume with some PEEP during anesthesia versus 11 against zero of PEEP, and there was much less pulmonary complications. And now, during the COVID time, it's interesting. This is a study published by, by our hospital. They are showing that even for COVID patients, you can, let's say, forget a little bit the lung protection uh, so to be on the blue line, you have to really keep your plateau pressures below 30, keep your tidal volume below 8 mLs per kilogram. And, uh, and in, in this case, patients were in the red line, is patients that are in the first 24 hours of mechanical ventilation, one of these parameters is not under this strict criteria. So somehow tidal volumes were a little bit above eight mLs per kilogram and plateau pressures were around above 32. So in COVID they had, even the, in the era of protective ventilation and in our hospital that everyone was, was thinking that they were applying protective ventilation, uh, you see a difference in mortality. So you have each, uh, let's say, each mistake you do at the bedside, not following the rules, causes some damage to the patients. So this is true. So protective ventilation, even for COVID patients, was never so important. And um, so I, I think the devil is in the details, and uh, especially for PEEP, how to, uh, how to individualize the PEEP and how to improve uh, the prognosis of these patients. And uh, I like to say that uh, these details were not uh, just the details, they, they, are, they are really important things that you do under mechanical ventilation. Which are the problems that we have in those trials? F the first of them, I think uh, we lack uh, basic monitoring to check if we are really doing something uh, that could be bad for the patients. Li like in this situation, we just check the airway pressures that they were really applying and under standardized conditions. The second problem is the lack of physiological understanding. And I'm going to give an example. This is the ART trial. This is a patient in my ICU, which theoretically people should be very should have a good training in mechanical ventilation. And this is a patient that was randomized for this study, and then we were recording uh, using EIT. And look, look at, this is airway pressures, this is flow, and this is the electrical impedance tomography. As you can see, the patient has air hunger, you can see that the airway pressures, they drop below uh, below baseline PEEP during inspiration and uh, in many cycles you have breath stacking. You can see here fr from the EIT that this is the, nor the only two breaths that were not stacked and this is 6 ml per kilogram which means that these triple stacking breath was receiving 15 ml per kilogram of tidal volume. And then when you look at the ventilator yeah, they, these patients, they were ventilated using the servo eye. The ventilator was showing you exactly 6 mLs per kilogram of tidal volume. So the ventilator does not compute breath stacking because it resets the tidal volume each new breath. And so, the, and this patient was receiving high PEEP. If you look at this number here, it's 20. So triple stacking on top of 20 of PEEP is even worse. It's a, in fact, it's a disaster. And this patient uh, later on had a pneumothorax. So uh, we know now that the clusters of breath stacking is the most 
damaging factor for a patient under mechanical ventilation. And this is still missing any good monitoring at the bedside. But let's now, I, I talked about the bad things about high PEEP, but let's talk about uh, good things that uh, sometimes people forget. This study was published in JAMA. It came from my hospital and uh, we were re responsible for this study. In this study, we randomized patients uh, after cardiac surgery presenting signals of acute lung injury to, to receive a, a a higher PEEP with protective ventilation we, with recruiting maneuvers or the conventional PEEP of the institution which was 8. Why we chose a PEEP of 13 as an average? Uh, this, uh, this number could be increased only if the body mass index was higher than 30 something then PEEP was increased to 15. Um, because this was the uh, we we titrated using EIT and this was the average peak of this uh, population of patients the the highest pressure achieved during the recruiting maneuver was 45 so 300 patients and then uh, the this is a typical image of a recruiting maneuver after applying the recruiting maneuver we have a much more dorsal ventilation showing that uh, we reduced the, the dorsal atelectasis and then this is a graph uh, showing pulmonary complications from death very very severe complications moderate complications and then when we applied this strategy we can see that we decreased everything right so all pulmonary complications decreased and th the result was very significant and this is why they publishing in JAMA and we presented in the opening ceremony of the Jean-Louis Vincent meeting. So this was a very positive trial about PEEP and recruiting maneuvers. No case of pneumothorax. Everything went in the direction that we were ex expecting. Patients, uh, they reduced the length of stay, so two days less of stay in the ICU, less two days less in the hospital. So this was a very positive study about high PEEP. The, the study was very carefully done. So every patient, we assessed the, 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 with the leg raising maneuver if the patient could tolerate the recruitment maneuver. So we were very concerned about the side effects of the recruiting maneuver. And as you can see, during the recruiting maneuver, there was a small drop in, uh, in blood pressure but never below 60 so we are very we very carefully followed the airway pressures um, and uh, in, at the same time in conjunction with these studies we also perform additional experiments in animals to show that whenever we apply the uh, recruitment maneuver and we successfully successfully reduced the driving pressures for instance in animals you can reduce the driving pressures by eight centimeters of water using the same type of volume okay these animals they have exactly the same type of volume as these animals A and look at the difference in the situation of the lung this is the lung after lung injury so all animals were in a very bad shape and now they they are going to be submitted to 48 hours to this strategy or this strategy the same type of volume in both but here the average people was 8 the average people was 16 okay and this is the result so it was absolutely visible in macroscopic and microscopic e evaluation so when we applied an optimized PEEP for these animals so there was much less lung injury we have less production of collagen in the lung, less uh, infiltrates of neutrophils in the lung, and even the PET images uh, showed much less inflammation. So everything that is yellow here is very inflamed. And then when we applied the proper PEEP, the, there were many less neutrophils inside the lung. So, um, so uh, I, I think uh, this idea of driving pressure 
applies very much to all the animals. So this is the study of the New England in patients, but uh, it's absolutely true that in animals, if we apply a certain PEEP level that reduces driving pressure, we can be successful. Um, something that we learned in the, in the last years is that uh, when you have high driving pressure, this is also related to lung fibrosis. This study was performed in our institution and then we had, uh, for each patient, we had at least uh, two CTs after the discharge of the hospital and we were measuring lung fibrosis by CT. This is the study. What we found is that, uh, for instance, if you measure vital capacity or if you measure the density of the lung in terms of CT and the average driving pressure uh, in the first week of mechanical ventilation, there is an inverse relationship, which means that the higher the driving pressure you apply in your patient, the, lo the lower the lung volume six months later. So it means that this patient had more lung fibrosis. So driving pressure is not only important for inflammation, but it's also important for lung fibrosis. We can see here that when driving pressure was low, there was no procollagen in the blood. And when driving pressure was high, there was a lot of procollagen in the blood and it was increasing along the time. So what happened in the last years is that we understood that a high PP strategy can only be good if you are causing a drop in driving pressure. If you are increasing PEEP and not causing any benefit in terms of driving pressure, forget about it. You are going to collect only the side effects. And so the, uh, the, the other mistake we had uh, during the ART trial is that they didn't do any pilot study to see how much they were reducing driving pressures. And this is the result. In the ART trial, this is why I, I told you, when, when, we, when we did the first analysis with 100 patients, we realized that the reduction in driving pressure was only one centimeter of water. Along with the, the week, one centimeter of water is impossible to get any positive result because there is no effect size. There is no, uh, so we increased PEEP, but we didn't get any benefit in physiological benefit, except for oxygenation. But oxygenation, everyone knows that it's not an important outcome. It's kind of cosmetic. So this is why we, I, I, I realized, wow, with this reduction in driving pressure, this trial will never get positive and then you are going to collect the side effects. It's, it's like making a study about ECMO, like uh, Warren Zapo did in the past. He put patients on ECMO, but he kept the tidal volume exactly the same as before ECMO. Then the result was predictable. The mortality is going to be higher if you use ECMO, because you have now the side effects of ECMO and side effects of mechanical ventilation. And here the same thing. So we you are increasing PEEP, collecting all the bad side effects of high PEEP, but you cannot have any benefit with this minimum reduction in driving pressure. So we know nowadays that uh, any positive trial would need, would need at least a reduction of three to four centimeters of water in driving pressure, because uh, otherwise you need a sample size of more than 1,000 patients, which is impossible. So just to give you an idea, in the, our study in 98, uh, the reduction in driving pressure between treatment arm and control arm was 40. In the ARMA trial was eight. And then they were successful when reaching 800 patients. If we, do, we, we, if we think about a new PEEP study, we have to get this reduction in driving pressure. Otherwise, you have to to randomize too many patients. And, uh, and certainly, let me skip this. In, in the ARMA trial, um, it was impossible to achieve this side effect. 
and also many recent studies sh trying to understand if uh, low tidal volume or high tidal volume below or above 8 ml per kilogram in patients with, uh, without ARDS if they are protective they, they because the compliance of these patients is very good the reduction in driving pressure is going to be very small and then all these studies they have exactly the same mortality and uh, we published at the beginning of the last year uh, an important study showing that the reduction in tidal volume is especially important if you have low compliance if you have a good compliance you you have to give more sedation to reduce tidal volume but you are going to reduce your driving pressure by just one centimeter of water and then the benefit is going to be much lower um, let me skip this and now um, so where how how we can address this problem of people uh, what uh, what I believe is going to happen in the next years so first of all uh, I think uh, I like it very much the previous presentation because uh, you presented exactly the same meta-analysis I'm presenting here even after the publication of the art trial there is still equipoise why this is important so equipoise means that there is a little bit suggestion of of benefit so the odds ratio is below one which means improved mortality of using recruiting maneuvers and PEEP but uh, it's equipoise which means that it's impossible to decide uh, which is best but why this is important for us it's important because if you believe in the physiological benefits of a recruiting maneuver you are ethically okay in still using it it's it's a procedure that is still ethical and has to be better studied in the future and this is exactly what I believe and uh, just to, to give you some examples during the COVID pandemic we did lots of studies using EIT using uh, this recruitment tool that you have seen in the previous presentation and checking uh, how much the patients with COVID they benefit uh, from a high PEEP strategy why because there was this whole controversy about uh, phenotypes of uh, COVID patients L phenotypes or age phenotypes and then people including our hospital we are very skeptical about using PEEP in those patients because some publications were, were uh, suggesting that these patients they have uh, huge amounts of over distension if you apply high PEEP so we we tested this and we did uh, not only a study in our ICU but we did an international collaboration to assess how much those patients can be recruited what what do we have seen first of all is that whenever we applied a proper PEEP in those patients typically we could reduce driving pressure by four centimeters of water and this can only mean that these patients are recruitable because if you the patient that is not recruitable if you increase PEEP you are going to increase driving pressures and for these patients whenever we apply the proper PEEP driving pressures dropped by four centimeters of water then uh, during the last years also we did a study in post-operative patients and we found that uh, whenever we apply the ideal PEEP for each patient I'm going to define what is ideal PEEP we could reduce driving pressure by six centimeters of water which is a lot and look at this the larger the body mass index the larger the drop in driving pressure which means that optimizing PEEP is especially important for obese patients these are the patients that need PEEP the most right 
and uh, doesn't have to be super obese. So if you have a body mass index around 30, which is very common during the COVID time, the average body mass index in my unit during the COVID time was 33, which means that in these patients I could reduce driving pressures by six centimeters of water by applying a proper PEEP strategy. And, uh, and uh, there is this very interesting publication that we did together with the uh, Massachusetts General Hospital in, in Boston, because there they have a problem with the super obese, look at the body mass index of this person, and look at the small lung buried inside the body. So these patients, are, they are really big size patients. And what happened is that uh, in these patients, they had massive amounts of atelectasis just because they are laying down in the bed. And then in these patients, when we started to apply uh, a proper PEEP, we could reduce driving pressures by five centimeters of water. So again, proving this concept that uh, there is a special population of patients that benefit from high PEEP to say the least, at least any obese patient should receive a little bit higher PEEP and should be tested for recruitability. And then when they started to apply this strategy, they reduced the mortality by half. So even in Boston, applying the best standard of care, when they started to apply this strategy of higher PEEP, they reduced mortality by half. So this paper was published in the critical care, which means that uh, you know the history of PEEP is controversial, but there is some cases of success. And I believe that all the studies that are searching for an individualized PEEP, they, they you have better chances of being successful. And why, why um, I, I is another reason to believe in this idea of individualization. This is the hazard ratio inside the ART trial. So how this works? This works more or less in, in this manner. So look, in the x-axis you have here the driving pressure, okay? And this is the hazard ratio of being randomized to high PEEP. For instance, if, I, if my, I enter the trial and my baseline driving pressure is 10, okay, 10, then if I'm randomized to the treatment arm, to the high PEEP arm, I have higher chances, above one, 20% more chances of dying. So if my driving pressure is low, and I'm going to receive a high PP strategy, I'm going to die. But then if you pick up the patients with driving pressure above 15, they benefit from a high PEEP strategy. So this is, so we, looking at this information, you, you understand that at least there are two target populations for high PEEP and for testing recruitability. Obese, and patients presenting a high driving pressure at baseline. So these are the patients that you should pay attention and test if you can do something a little bit better, especially assessing recruitability. So with driving pressures above 15, you have to do something. So you cannot, uh, you cannot say, oh, I'm okay because my tidal volume is six mLs per kilogram. This is not enough. You have to do something to reduce further your driving pressures. And, uh, and we did this in patients with COVID, so every patient uh, received um, um, some monitoring. Uh, typically, when monitoring with EIT, we, we, we search for the PEEP level uh, of the crossing point of the collapsing curve and hyperdistension. In this particular patient, the crossing point was 18. Later on, we can, we can discuss why crossing point makes sense. Uh, it's interesting to see that uh, this PEEP level, individualized per patient, doesn't mean that we are increasing PEEP. In fact, if I compare the ARDSNET PEEP, low PEEP FIO2 table, and the individualized PEEP, 
you see that at least in half of the patients I have to decrease my PIP levels. In other half I have to increase the PIP levels. So it's not high PIP, it's a different PIP individualized for that patient. For instance, if the patient is obese, very likely he's going to receive a higher PIP. But also there is some individual anatomy of the patient that dictates this. And uh, in this trial, when we applied this individualized PIP, compliance improved and in stayed improved along the whole stay in the ICU. So it's a, it's a long-term benefit for these patients. And driving pressures, in general, they were four centimeters of water smaller during the whole stay of the ICU. And as a result, this is something that we got in this uh, COVID trial, and we are just publishing these results now. The time to oxygen free was reduced by eight days. So oxygen free, free days, which means that the patient entered the ICU and was intubated until the time that he was extubated and then and then free from oxygen because sometimes in COVID patients many times they okay they could stay only one week in mechanical ventilation but this they stay with two weeks needing supplemental oxygen and this is very troublesome because the patient cannot go home at least in Brazil so the time they, they enter the ICU until the time that they were free from oxygen we could reduce this by 18 days by applying this PP strategy. Why, why we use this outcome? Because I knew from the previous study, uh, the successful study in postoperative cardiac patients, that this is the most sensitive outcome for showing an improvement in lung function. Because it's something that is really measuring how much you recovered your lung function. And uh, uh, so uh, this is uh, another way of measuring. It's a, it's a, it's a outcome called oxygen-free days because in this case you give minus one, one if the patient dies and then he doesn't have any free days of uh, oxygen. And, and, and then we have a significant difference between the two groups. So uh, we improved the oxygen-free days and certainly we did not increase mortality otherwise this index here would not be significant um, so the future um, I think uh, we should always think about interventions to dec decrease driving pressure we should think about predictive enrichment what is predictive enrichment is is uh, is uh, you know there uh, nowadays there is these two uh, let's say new words one is prognostic enrichment and the other one is predictive enrichment what what is the difference the difference is the following uh, prognostic enrichment is is that uh, oh I'm going to choose for my trial patients with high mortality why because then if your strategy improves mortality um, it's easier to show a difference if you if baseline mortality is already 50 percent but for instance if you you are going to start a study with a baseline mortality of five percent you have to randomize millions of patients right so but this is prognostic enrichment so the problem with prognostic enrichment is that maybe your treatment improves lung condition but uh, uh, in a very large scale but the impact in mortality is low because the patients are dying because of other factors like renal failure so prognostic enrichment is not a very wise way of doing trials but predictive enrichment is different because predictive enrichment means I'm going to target a specific population that benefits the most for instance if I'm going to treat lung cancer or uh, breast cancer I'm going to choose patients with a positive receptor of estrogen and then I'm going to give an antibody targeting these uh, receptors 
So if you're going to do a high PIP study, you have to be smart. So let's choose obese patients. Let's choose patients with high driving pressure because these are the patients that you are really uh, improving the chances of having a positive impact. Certainly you have to individualize PIP because it's impossible to look to a specific patient and guess oh, how much PIP the patient needs. And it's proven that it doesn't work to look at the x-ray and doesn't work looking at the oxygenation. These are two very bad, let's say, ways of assessing how much PIP your patient needs. And uh, something that w we, maybe w if we have time uh, to talk, but this is some trend in the future, you have to individualize your tidal volume based on driving pressure and individualize sedation also. And uh, if we have time, we can talk a little bit about this because this is a hot topic nowadays. Just to give you an example, first, we are using less and less opioids in the ICU and opioids was already a good improvement over benzodiazepines, but opioids now we know that they are very bad for assisted mechanical ventilation. And then we are trying to minimize as much as we can opioids and using much more propofol. And we are looking for new drugs and maybe inhale sedation is going to be the future. We don't know yet, but it's something that is being studied. And, uh, and that's it. So um, I think uh, uh, we... I think uh, there is a, a very important role for new studies. That is, a, I'm very optimistic that new studies using a new strategy to set PIP uh, is going to have a higher chances of uh, success. And as I, I as I showed you, I had already a, a very troubles, a very hard time during the low tidal volume strategy. So it was very difficult to prove that low tidal volume was good. And the PIP is just a harder story, but still I believe that we are going to prove that there, I there is a good PIP strategy for your patients. And I especially believe in this idea of assessing recruitability because it's a good way of doing predictive enrichment. So if you do the maneuver and you check that your patient has more than 50% gain in compliance, you can be sure that uh, this patient is going to benefit a lot from a higher PP strategy and especially a higher PP strategy in combination with, uh, with a recruitment maneuver. Okay, just uh, I'm, I, I should uh, finish the my presentation here but I would like to say just uh, give me just one minute that I would like to present uh, the preliminary results of this study this is a multi-center study to assess recruitability in patients with uh, ARGS but then pandemia came and then basically is going the first uh, 150 patients, they are all with COVID. So this is study, the first part of this study is recruitability in COVID. What, uh, what, what this study showed, uh, and, as you, I, and as you can see, the highest pressure here was 24 plus 15 of, uh, of uh, pressure control ventilation, which means that these patients, they had a uh, highest airway pressure of 40 centimeters of water in some pa when the patient was more obese uh, the highest uh, inspiratory pressure was 45 centimeters of water using this strategy now zero cases of pneumothorax zero cases in all centers so no single case of pneumothorax and uh, and this is the, f the final results. You see, this is recruitability. So this is a histogram. And you can see that one third of the patients, they had high recruitability above 40 to 45%. Um, the, 
the results are very different from previous studies. So, so this is the original study of Gattinoni, trying to say that uh, the average recruitability is just 13%. Then we have this study of Proti that was suggesting that was only 24%. And then this is the result of uh, the current study. So the median is 32%. So which means that uh, when you have a median of 32, this means that at least half of your patients, they have more than one third of the lung close and you can recover this. So more than one third. So certainly uh, using a kind of recruitability assessment is going to identify at least half of the patients that you can recruit more than one third of the lung. So this is a lot. And uh, uh, this means that you can very easily recognize patients that uh, you can reduce driving pressures by four, five, six centimeters of water, and this represents half of the patients. So it's a, a, a very important number. Um, and then uh, how much PEEP, uh, this is an interesting information, how much PEEP you need for the highly recruitable patients and for the low recruiters? 16 and 10. So no more than very, it's no single case of PEEP above 20, okay? No single case of PEEP above 20. The average was 16. So if you re identify a highly recruitable patient, very likely your average PEEP is going to be around 16. And then you're going to be optimizing the best lung mechanics. Look at the difference in, in, in over distension. If you take these patients and you apply a, a PEEP of 24, for instance, according to the ARDSNET table, you are going to cause 70% of hyperdistension. But if you have the highly recruitable patients, over distension is, is only 30%. So it, it's a big difference because this patient is going to receive a high PEEP, but ver very, uh, we present very little over distension. And now someone was asking me about the recruitment to inflation ratio. And I put here in, in parallel, so uh, the recruitability in terms of, uh, so according to the, this recruitability, either using uh, EIT or using compliance to assess recruitability, you come to these three classifications, okay? And then I put here the recruitment to inflation ratio that you can measure according to the procedure described by Laurent Brochard, right? And as you can see, there is a big overlap. Look at this uh, intermediate recruitment. Let me put here. So this is the mid, high, and low, right? So you see this goes from 0.7, 54 to 0 0.95, which overlaps with this <coughs> category here. So I think the recruitment to inflation ratio is a good index, but uh, has low specificity and low sensitivity to detect the recruiters. So I prefer much more to use EIT or gaining compliance to do this kind of assessment. And I think this is the main message of uh, of uh, of this study. So let us finish here. <coughs>